friend of mine who could actually tell you about the size when they came in. So he's saying there was nine to ten pound fish always came in January. He said the biggest fish came in February. They were 15 pound plus. And then he said, I think there were about 11, 12 pound fish sort of March, April. You know, down to each month, this guy, he got a lot of salmon on the Liffey uh, in his days. And then the, the grills run comes in in sort of July, August. And that's mainly what, what the river is now, the bulk of the fish of the grills. Hello and welcome to the Ireland on the Fly podcast about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. There's no two ways about it, but 2023 has been a tough year for salmon anglers. Between trying to deal with extremes of wet and heat, and then when conditions did come good, the numbers of fish arriving were far below expectations, which are already on a falling scale as it is. It's easy to blame climate change and what's going on out in the oceans, but what about some of the impactful actions we can take closer to home, and what kind of positive effects can it have? Connor Arnold previously told us about increased salmon numbers in the Baltic, so can anything be done here in Ireland? Well, Mark McAndrew is a passionate fly angler and conservationist who, in his own time, has decided to see what he can do and how he can help through the Leffy Salmon Project, and we'll find out shortly about the fruits of the labour there. Tom, it's absolutely fascinating to hear about the River Liffey as it was once such an important river for anglers. It really was, wasn't it? I mean, um, funny, I didn't touch on it too much, but I, I was just thinking of it since, like I remember reading, uh, I think it's, you know, me, my old books, uh, Fishing and Thinking, and he talks about fishing the Liffey and, you know, how it was a common sight, not, or not a common sight, to see people walking through uh, Dublin from Island Bridge carrying a spring salmon. You know, they would have caught down there. And, you know, I was very much part of it. And, and then you touched on it there when you say, like, you as a dub, how much you would mean, you know, to a Dubliner. And there there you had, a, you know, the main, the, the, the river going through our capital city was a salmon river, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's fascinating to hear, isn't it? It's a motive, you know, if you're a dub, the Liffey is, it's a bit like, I suppose, carb for Galway people, you know? Yeah. The Lee for, for Cork people. Um, mm. You know, and even like people forget, like, kind of leak slip. You know, salmon leap. Mm. That's what it was in Norse. Yeah. You know, like yeah. it just, and I always love that whenever, you know, I'm back in Dublin, I'm crossing over the lift and I'm always looking down and especially down by Christchurch, you know, I'm always pointing out to the kids like this was where the heart of the city was. It was built around this river and to imagine what it must have been like, you know, back in the, back in the day um, in terms mm. of the importance of the, the salmon back then. And it's what I love when you hear somebody like Mark, most people probably have never heard of him and the work that he's doing. You know, yeah. along with the other people in the Liffey Salmon Project to try and rehabilitate, I suppose, for want of a better word, to bring the salmon numbers back just for some kind of, I think, isn't it, for them to be able to say, yeah, there's salmon in the Liffey. Yeah, and like, you know, and as he says, there are still salmon in the Liffey. But, you know, as he points out as well, it wasn't too long ago where there was quite a decent number of salmon in the Liffey. You know, it's not that long ago at all. You're talking about 12, 13 years ago. When there was, he says, three thousand in total, ran it uh, uh, or whatever. But you know, a decent run. It wasn't phenomenal. Two thousand, two thousand. I think it was. He was yeah, it was two thousand. Yeah. Um, and you know, and talking to him, and, and and some of the things that he says, which I found really, really fascinating, was you know, there are things that that can be done that could, you know, I won't say remedy it or bring it back to you know what it was prior to all the impediments that went on to it, but you know. That there are things that could be done there and like fair play and you, you touched on that fair play to him you know sort of unsung hero you know forming that committee forming that group and going about and you know knocking on doors bringing people and um you know to use the phrase getting up off his ass and doing something you know and not only that but turning out on to the liffy on january the first <laughs> to cast the line <laughs> My God, fair play. <laughs> yeah, fair play. And then like, you know, within a lifetime, with, within a generation, maybe a bit more, but like, you know, as he says, there was a time where, you know, you might only get 20 minutes on one of the stands. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, it it has died and, and he does that talk about that kind of early 2000s, you know, the, the Salmon Anglers Club, the Dublin Salmon Anglers, you know, there would have been much more involved in terms of the fishing. And now that's probably more to do with, you know, having a pint and talking about the fishing rather than actually getting out now because you know if the numbers aren't there of course the interest is going to wane yeah but it'd be amazing to think if that could be brought back as well that people go yeah where are you going i'm, I'm off going off to island bridge there to a bit yeah. of salmon fishing and like very interesting as well like cause it, it is quite possible because he mentions you know the water quality the water quality is quite good he touches on you know within within 
very close to the city center, there are parts of the river where there's mayfly hatching. You know, <laughs> you know, I mean, so you know, water quality isn't as big an issue with it. That's why a lot of the other things that he's talking about, you know, it sounds you know feasible. And you know, you asked him what his goal was, and you know, it's very interesting to hear the answer. And you know, God, you know, it would be great if that goal is achieved. It's not like you're trying to bring this Liffey back, you know, like the Moy or you know the wet back in the day, but to bring it back yeah. to some sort of kind of um, wild habitat and wild salmon running in it again. And, and then who knows from, from there where you can take it. And the thing, and also as well, and I say this as, as a goal in that, but surely it'd be something that dubs could be proud of, you know? Yeah. 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 That's, but like you know, I, I've often saw the amazing, like I remember actually, and, and the daughter is similar, you know, and, and we can be rightly proud and we're going to do another episode on the daughter mm. um, at another time um, in terms of how well that's doing, especially as a brown trout fishery. Yeah. Is and I remember Ken Whelan telling me actually um, he would have been walking down by the daughter, and there was salmon there, and uh, there was people having like cappuccinos, you know, beside the the river. Yeah. And he says they had no, and he and he walked over to them, and they were, they were you know, looking at him. What, what's he looking at like? And he says, "Can you see it that over there?" And they're like, "No, no. What are you talking about?" He says, "Salmon over there." And they're like, "What? Here." In Dublin, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. you know, and the daughter, like this small little river, and he, they were—he was able to point out, and they were actually able to make it out. And they said they were just shocked beyond belief. Yeah. You know, this is so. It's when you can introduce that. You know, that's a, the next time. You know, if you're walking over, mm. you look down. Oh my God, there's a fish there. You know, it's. I don't think it's pie in the sky. No, and no. this is fair play to Mark. He's he's trying to do something about it. So yeah, I'm feeling more guilty by the day. <laughs> I need to get off my ass. <laughs> start being more proactive and stop recording podcasts and actually start doing something <laughs> well hopefully this will help yes exactly exactly yes, we're we're, yeah. we're um, amplifying the message you know doing that, our that's bit. our job <laughs> doing our bit well look let's hear from mark mcandrew now and i first asked him about his work with the liffey salmon project i'm currently operating as sort of the director of the liffey salmon project and i was a founding member of it it was founded about three years ago during covid because um a group of us became very concerned about the the plummeting salmon stocks in the river liffey we'd actually heard word that you know numbers were people who were catching them were had had ceased catching them all together so we began to do a bit of research and we found that the numbers had actually crashed above the dam and leak slip they'd gone down to even as low as 19 in 2019 and there's the stock above the below the dam um, was also decreasing quite rapidly. So we formed a group and uh, began to take action. And um, we just went about research and everything about the river. And then, um, you know, began to get things in place to carry out works to see could we take action to help the, the stocks. The group of us that got together, was it like a scientific background? Was it a pure angling background? Was it a mix? What was it? Basically, it's anglers, but we have a couple of scientific people in it. Like we have one biologist. We also have a guy who was doing a PhD in marine biology. And then I kind of I read a lot of scientific stuff, research just as a hobby, particularly in fishing. And then we sort of have a broad range of people who have different sort of experiences with the Liffey. Like we have people who fished it right back in the 70s and the 80s and were there for the heyday. With guys from different parts of the catchment, particularly at the lower end. So we've, you know, we've a guy who's uh, in the the Rye Club in Leak Slip and is very familiar with the founding member of that club. We have people who've experienced uh, the Dublin salmon anglers. We have people who fished in Lucan. So we sort of all the bases covered uh, on our section of the Liffey. Brilliant, and ultimately, it's people who are passionate about the river and want to try and you know see what can be done to improve things. Um, I have to say, as a dub growing up, the Liffey was you know such an iconic river for me. Um, you know, you, you, it was funny. You'd always hear of the stories that, oh yeah, there used to be salmon caught in it. You know, and you, you know, you think of it as an urban river. Um, but maybe give us a kind of an insight into kind of the historic kind of what it was like, because oftentimes the first time of the season would be caught in the Liffey, wouldn't it? Yeah. So the last time that happened was 2012, and as you said, it was quite a regular occurrence. Now, this is why we wanted to save the stock in the Liffey. Those uh, January, February fish are still in it. And they're still fish in excess of 20 pounds in weight still run the Liffey. So we feel it's a very a special genetic stock to the country and it'd be a shame to lose it. So um, it's, it's definitely worth saving. Um, in terms of the river, then the river, yeah, the river is sort of twofold. There's sort of, you have a section uh, above Leak Slip Dam, which is about 68% of the catchment and the section below the dam. Currently, the section below the dam has about 350 fish going through the counter each year. And then the, the last count, 80 went through the dam at Leak Slip. Now, if you go back to 2010, there was a thousand uh, below and a thousand above. 
So the numbers have declined mm. quite rapidly. They've declined by a third in the lower river and up to 95% in the upper river. Um, the upper river and the lower diff- river are two completely different entities. Uh, above Leak Slip Dam, you have sort of really good habitat. You have a, a few tributaries, but you have sort of a much more natural river, a lot of riffle pool glide. Whereas below the, the dam where we're mainly focused is, you know, it's 60%, 60, 70% of the catchment is impounded by weirs and under eight foot of water. And there's only five or six sites the salmon can spawn where there's riffle and glide. Uh, the rest of it is impounded heavily. And then we're reliant on maybe a couple of tributaries to uh, to keep the stock going. So the river rye water would be one. Because of the dams and because of the conditions there, it was going to be a struggle, which I suppose is compounded by the fact that, you know, we've got environmental issues, we've got conservation issues going on, which has made it worse. Is there one thing that you can point at the moment that is the kind of single big, biggest tributary contributory factor to the problem of the declining numbers? So we probably mentioned the dam, but if, if we look at the, the lower channel itself, the dam and the weirs there, when we looked at some of the spawning sites, the only ones that were really viable were ones directly below tributaries. Uh, they were the ones that still had gravel. So what I think happened is over time, the gravel that was sitting in these fast flowing areas washed into the impounded sections. And this was a gradual thing over time. The gravel isn't replenishing because there's so many barriers. So there's seven barriers between the dam and the sea. And then you also have a dam. And then above that dam, uh, at Pula Fuca, there's another dam. That, now that's above the historical range of the salmon. There was an impassable waterfall there. But sediments that would normally pass down the river uh, and gravels that would end up uh, and fish would use to spawn aren't making it down to the river because uh, they're being impounded by the dams and the barriers. So I would say that's having a massive impact. And I suppose at least these are fixable problems in that sense. Is that from your perspective? Yeah, no, they would be fixable. So like IFI have been alluding to barriers as a major problem in our rivers. And, um, you know, there's a couple of papers out in Denmark, what they're doing to remove barriers. If we removed a couple of barriers on the Liffey, that would open up, it would double or triple the amount of spawning habitat the salmon would have, and it would allow sediments to move. But basically what we have to do now, and we have a job going in at, at the Wren's Nest, where we have to artificially put in gravel uh, along a site for spawning because there isn't any suitable spawning there. So the water quality in the Liffey is probably the best it's ever been. Um, they used to have problems with sludge and stuff and, and, and stuff going in, but there's, there's a lot of mayfly and stuff hatching like only a couple of miles inside the city, and like there's videos my friend has where you can't see your hand in front of your face wet mayfly and other upwing flies. It's the water quality is so clean now, but there isn't a, a massive head of fish, trout or salmon. Um, nice. And I think it's it's purely down to the, the lack of viable spawning habitat and the, the lack of substrate for the fish to spawn. Can I ask, hi Mark, how's it going? Can I ask you a, a really, uh, it might be a stupid question, um, and it comes from a guy that I'm just more used to locks. What purpose do the weirs serve? So, so the weirs were put in as an industrial, an industrial uh, for industrial mills and stuff. So, the daughter and the Liffey, all these urban places, would have one every few miles. But at, effectively, at the moment, they're ornamental. Uh, they're not serving any purpose, but they're having a major uh, effect on the river. So, as I said, mentioned, they're catching the sediments, but it's also all, all the riffle pool glide combos the trout and salmon need are all under eight feet of water on the Liffey in particular. And it says that the a section above a weir is 90% less biodiverse than below the weir. So only a limited amount of um, fish and invertebrates can live in those ponded sections. So in the Liffey's case, 70% of it is impounded. So it's not viable for trout or salmon. You don't get upwing flies. So it, it's, you know, it's really poor habitat. The other thing, it, it affects the hydromorphology of the river. So you don't get the bends, you don't get the river flowing at the speeds it needs to. So you're effectively turning the river into a canal. Um, in Ireland, we have a lot of problems getting them out because um, people want to make them the heritage structures or uh, people like the look of them or planning. But they've taken a really hard line in some countries like Denmark, where they're just going in. There was one river they took out 40 and they just said, look, this is we're going to save the salmon. And they've it's had dramatic effects to, to for the population rebounding. The main, popul- the main problem for the salmon is people talk about salmon migrating upstream, but it's the smolts migrating downstream. Every barrier they hit keeps them in the river uh, days or even weeks longer. The longer they're in the river, the more predation they suffer mm. and they actually yeah. seem to get, get quite sickly. So is, there was studies done in Scotland where there was rivers side by side, rivers with no barriers where the smolts got out in a couple of days and rivers that had a lot of barriers where they were losing up to 90% of their smolts in the river. Now, they were alluding to problems at sea for the salmon's decline, but actually quite a lot of our rivers are, are heavily weird or the water quality is poor. 
So I feel if we can fix that uh, and control what we can do here, then we can look maybe out at sea and try and do something there. But there's a lot more we can do in our rivers. And there's a couple of projects being done in Ireland where salmon have rebounded quite a lot. There is an example on the Shannon. We sort of rode the coattails of guys on the Shannon, but they had a fry count of seven, which is very poor. And they did a lot of in-stream work there below Castle Connell. They got their fry count up to 47 in the space of a few years, which is massive. Now, they actually have a run of wild salmon there. The ESB are releasing hatchery smolts, uh, which are only a fraction of the fish that are returning. They're actually getting a lot more wild fish back than a hatchery fish. Um, and the reason is because the hatchery fish are only surviving at, at 0.5% or even less. And they're getting, um, they're getting the wild fish back at 2 to 3%. And um, so they have fishing there again because of the work they've carried out. So there's evidence there to say if, if we go in and we, we start to improve the habitat in our river, that uh, we can have better salmon runs. And we also had as well, Tom, wasn't it when we were speaking to Conor Arles, he was talking about the Baltic yeah. salmon and he was saying about, you know, highlighting the measures that were being done. But it, yeah, it was phenomenal. But it's really amazing because um, we didn't touch into any of the things that they've done for in, in, in Scandinavia. And you've just touched on one of them there, that, like in Denmark where they've come along and said, no, no, we've got to do this for the salmon, regardless of what, uh, and the success naturally that you have with it. But I wasn't aware that weirs caused so much of a problem. But like, you know, it's really interesting that you say that. I mean, it's very plain and, sim- very plain and simple to understand how they are such a problem, particularly with smokes returning. Yeah, for, for me, they're a major problem um, because obviously the migration up and downstream, but they just they affect the river in a negative way. They stop the river functioning as a river effectively. So you're losing the invertebrates, you're using the habitat the trout needs, the salmon needs, and then you're blocking. And then you're blocking also other species. You're blocking eels, you're blocking lamp- uh, lamprey. So the, the, the more rich the ecosystem is, the salmon grows up in, the more salmon you're going to have. So if we can get lamprey and everything up, uh, it, it's much better for the ecosystem. You know, there's a symbiotic relationship there. So weirs, you know, some people like the fish, sometimes the fish is well below them, but the consequence of having them, you know, is they're degrading the habitat in a big way. Tell me this, um, like, because you mentioned Denmark and we mentioned the Baltic salmon um, conservation measures. They seem to have been able to get things done or there was a lot of kind of will to get it done. In, your involvement with the Liffey Salmon Project is... Do you find that you have to go through a lot of bureaucracy? Is it is it hard to actually get things done quickly? I suppose like it, it, it can be. We've only been in operation three years and the sort of the projects that we've undertaken, I'll go through now. But the first the first thing for us, the first major thing was the dam at Leak Slip. Could we get a, a more modern fish path on it? And we sort of, I went to the Salmon and Sea Trail Conservation Fund to get a feasibility study done and that's sort of in progress at the moment. But we believe if we sort of study the fish passage there that um you know we can find something more modern the issue the smolts are having there coming down is there was three ways for them to come down they could come down through the turbine which was fatal because it's 320 rpm which means any smolt going through it is going to die there's no way through they could come through the the fish pass which depending on how much water is in it uh, can be fatal also or they had to go over the front of the dam which which wasn't which they struggled to find so we were trying to investigate maybe a more user-friendly way for the fish to get to get down. The fish on the way up also struggle as well because the the main attraction on the dam is on the wrong side, the main sort of velocity of the flow. So the fish are attracted to a tiny little fish pass on the other side. So sometimes they're held up. And I have sort of data there to say that the fish sometimes wait till October and they're fish that could have been in the river since January, February. So it holds them up a long time, which isn't great either. Um, what we had activated, I think, in our first year in operation is we got a small protocol activated at the dam. So I was lucky in the project in that every time I needed somebody to come along with a lot of information, um, I seemed to run into the right people. I built up a great network of people. But we learned that there was in the 90s, they were going to bring in this thing called the trash flap, which opens water, but it allows water off the surface where the smolts generally are. Whereas before, the smolts would have to dive down a few feet and go down and, and find a little way under a slip. But the small protocol pulls from the top. Now, the good thing when the, um, the trash flap is in, in operation, most of the water is going through it, which attracts the smolts, but the turbine can't be on. So that's been in operation three years, and we think that may have had uh, an effect in getting a, a larger number of smolts down through the dam. So we're just waiting to see in the counter figures in the next few years what effect it had. Um, as I said earlier, 68% of the catchment is above the dam and leak slip, and all the 
all the pristine best habitat is there, but the number above the dam is much, much smaller than below the dam where the habitat isn't so good. So that tells us that the dam is, is probably a major problem. Obviously. Can I just ask something there? Uh, you said um, uh, there about the fish pass. Like, doesn't sound like the, you said, like, it can be fatal for them. Surely the idea of a fish pass is that it's anything but fatal. So, so the fish pass, it's it's Borland Lock. So it was designed in the 1940s. Um, so it, it was designed to take the fish up, but not designed to take the fish down. So right. um, it, it was a, it's a one-way system. There's an Irish so, solution um, to the problem. Like, yeah. yeah. So so the guy, I think it was an Irish guy, they were fitted in all the dams in Ireland, the Borland Lift or the Borland Lock, the various designs of but I feel the the pass, it, it, look, where we're, it's nearly 100, near, getting close to 100 years on, I think we could... Uh, there's, there's more modern and more efficient ways to get fish around dams. And a recent seminar there on the continent of Europe, they felt that they could keep a salmon population going with up to three dams. Any more than that, they would struggle. Now, there's nowhere in Ireland. I think maybe the Lee might be the only one where there's two dams. But we, we're, we're struggling here keeping the salmon populations getting past one dam. So it, it's probably time to upgrade some of the, the fish passes. <laughs> now, I think it might be. Mm, now, in, in our case, the ESB have been very helpful. So we've been dealing with um, their ESB mm. biologist, Dennis Doherty, but they've actually come on board and they've, they've been very easy to deal with and, you know, they've been helping us out the whole way. So we formed a good relationship there. Well, fingers crossed for that. There will be a, yeah. an upgrade on, on the on that side of it. The, what's the salmon run again and what, what percentage get past the dam? So so if the salmon run, I'll give you a quick, quick breakdown of the salmon run historically. So... When I went back, I actually spoke to a guy who was alive in the 1950s and he lived in Ballymore Eustace. And he was telling me that when he was going to school over the bridge, this is the upper range of the salmon at Ballymore Eustace, he could see, you could walk across their backs looking off the bridge. He said there were so many, he said they were everywhere. So the dam was commissioned just at the end of the, the, the 40s, I think it was 49. And then there was a decline then sort of into the 50s and 60s. But I believe at the peak in the 50s and 60s, there was about 16,000 salmon. Now, after the dam petered out, that started to decline. And then UDN hit in the 70s. And, and for most of the 70s, there was only about 200 fish in the river. Now, I think the UDN waned. And then they, they started a small-scale hatchery in Island Bridge. And the numbers started to rebound. And they, the numbers peaked then at about 4,000 in, in, I think it was 1989 or 1990. And then the numbers sort of, they sort of went down again for 10 years and back up slightly and down, where you had sort of a bumper year in uh, 2010, where, where it sort of peaked to 2,000 fish ran through Island Bridge and 1,000 through Leak Slip. So at that stage, you had 50-50 in, in the river. Now, in an ideal world, if there's no dam there, there should be a lot more fish above the dam because there's a conservation limit uh, on, on both parts of the river. It's 5,000 above Leak Slip and it's only 1,700 below Leak Slip. So that tells you that there should be a lot more up there. But at least at that stage, it was 50-50. So then in the last 10 years, the numbers sort of just started to go down. They started to crash, particularly above the dam. So you had, I think in 2019, uh, you had 19 went through the dam. That was a partial count. The counter was out of order for three for three months of the year. But the counter was then out of action then for a few years. So we didn't know. So we got a count last year and we were desperate to find out what it was. Is there enough of a semblance of a population to, um, to, to keep going? So 80 fish went through it. Um, I'd say about 30 or 40 were multi, multi sea winter fish so it, it, it's not great but it's probably something to hang on to in the lower river we didn't get a full count either because the mill race was opened where the fish pass is at Island Bridge and the fish there was no pull from the fish pass so we think they went around it but um, the count was about 150 but I believe that's wrong so it's been about 300 on average the last 3 or 4 years and then before that, it was sort of 400, 500. It was all the way back up to 1,000. But I, I, th I, think it's, I think it's sort of stabilized at 300 in the lower Liffey. And um, a lot of those fish are being are being born and uh, recruited from the River Rye. Where does the Rye run in, actually? Sorry. The Rye uh, runs in just below the dam in Leakslip. Right. So, so it's, 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 yeah. it's, right, it's right there. Like, yeah. like, and is there fishing allowed? Is there, it's catch and release? What's the season? Is it very limited in terms of when or who can fish it? So, no, it's, it's, it's almost com a completely open end. There's a couple of clubs on it, but um, Dublin Salmon Anglers own Island Bridge. They would have had fast extenses of the river, but they don't, they don't own all the, the river like they used to anymore. Uh, the Liffey had a very active salmon fishing community until it was closed, I think, in 2006, I think, up to maybe 2011 or 2010. 
and that killed off most of the salmon anglers and the clubs. And then the, the, the river was reopened for catch and release. Now, it was reopened for catch and release because the fry count uh, was up to, the, was, was, was up to the, the number needed. And that's what's kept it open for catch and release. But of the spawning sites, when they do the electrofishing on the rye, there's 15 or 20 sites where, 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 where they electrofish for fry. If you look at the main channel, then there's only five. And of the five, only two of them are green sites, which means they, they, their density for fry is high. And I said they're both below tributaries where there's gravel feeding in. And do you get many lads out fishing for salmon now on the Liffey Lake? I'd say only only a handful, um, very, very few. It's rare enough to see it now. Um, most people are, are trout fishermen on it, but um, I'd say you'd be doing well. I'd say between 10 and 20 anglers. Um, it'd be tin on the ground. Now, there's fish there, and we see fish quite a lot, but it's, it's, it's it could be tough going. As I said earlier, there's not a lot of really good fly water there is some mm. and the fish are quite thin on the ground so we're really fishing bottlenecks place where the fish get stuck uh below weirs and things and are many caught and landed um each season now I, I'd, I'd say probably less than 10 fish are probably caught a season at, at the moment wow and tell me mark because we touched on it before historically like it used to have the first time of the year what were the catches like in years gone by, historically, do you have any data? Do you have so, double salmon? Yeah, yeah. Or? So, like, if you go back to 1991 or 1992, they were saying well over 150 springers were caught. There was always a January run of fish. And uh, there's a friend of mine who can actually tell you by the size when they came in. So he's saying there was nine to 10 pound fish always came in January. He said the biggest fish came in February. They were 15 pound plus. And then he said, I think there were about 11, 12 pound fish sort of March, April. And then I can't remember after that but he had you know down to each month this guy he got a lot of salmon on the Liffey uh, in his days and then the, the grilts run comes in in sort of July August and that's mainly what, what the river is now the bulk of the fish are the grilts but the fish in the Liffey are quite different the grilts are the longest grilts in Ireland they're longer and thinner and we suspect that's because they have to go so far and they were evolved in river before the dams it was probably quite violent and they had to run a long way in heavy water. And the springers are actually much shorter and much stubbier than all the other rivers in Ireland. And we're lucky that actually a guy called Arthur Went wrote a huge amount of data on the salmon of the Liffey in the 1940s and 30s and before. So he's a massive amount. So he catalogued basically everything, every characteristics of the salmon, where they spawned. And a lot of the stuff is still true today. Amazing, isn't mm. it? Like it's That's amazing. really interesting. That's <laughs> really interesting about the, the, the difference between the grills and the multi or fish. And, and just and, in saying know, that, originate. you were mentioned earlier the tributaries because of the lack of the tributaries and and options for spawning. We believe the springers are so short and stubby because they don't go very far, and uh, yeah. they're spawning in sort of the main channel in 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 sort of temperate, hard, hard, um, fast flowing water. So, so basically, what you're saying is the springers are like front row forwards, basically. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and the grills, and... the grills of the athletes, the wingers. Yeah, the, the guys out in the wing. <laughs> wow, that's that that's amazing. Also, as well, what you said about the guy who used to fish it so regularly, the different sizes of fish each month that he caught. You know that you know. Whereas, it didn't. You know, it, it seems to be that February the biggest ones came. Yeah, and that sort of peaked, and then they just returned to a normal size as well. That's that. I think that's amazing. Is was it because they were later that they put on an extra bit of weight? But therefore, you know, the March fish should have been heavier again, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a funny one. You would think that they'd be getting heavier up till, yeah. the, up till the grills run, but it's not for whatever reason. But it might be like the Moy where there's different, they're heading to different places or whatever it yeah. was. But then um, this guy was very diligent. He kept, he, he still does, he keeps notes on every fish he ever caught. And, and he, he really he caught a lot of fish and he still fishes the Liffey a little bit. But, you know, he... He said you could you could set your watch by by the size of the fish that you're a good catch. And come here, actually. Uh, what what's the record salmon from the Liffey rod caught? I'm not sure, but there is a lot of photos around. Um, and there was a video it used to be on YouTube of, of great salmon of Ireland, but there was a few Liffey fish on it. But there would have been fish in the late twenties for sure. Right. And there is the odd fish of that size hooked by usually lads pike fishing, hooked and lost. Yeah. You hear stories of monster fish. Yeah. Now we th those fish are still in, but in very small quantity. Um, and we can't get a count on the springers because the water, because they're discharging so heavily from the dam, and it's tidal at where the counter is. When, when the tide meets the big water, the the weir there where the counter is becomes obsolete, and the fish don't use the counter. 
So we only get a partial count for the spring salmon. So the spring salmon numbers were up actually slightly last year, which gave us a glimmer of hope. And we probably didn't count all of them. So we're not sure how many there is, but it's, it's, it's not looking so bad. It's looking, it's improving. Just so I can kind of get a handle on it for people as well, um, Mark, is, you know, the better conditions in terms of spawning, you're saying, are past the dam. It's a bit be- are you looking for basically you're saying if we could get a better fish pass put in, that that would help in terms of the numbers going through. You've already seen 80 go through, so we've something to start with there. We know they can, they're getting through. So if we could get a better fish pass, it'll encourage more to come through, which will therefore ho- hopefully help the next generation of salmon to grow on, and hopefully numbers will increase that way. That's one element to, to it. Is that right? Yeah, it's about making it as easy for the fish as possible, particularly the smalls coming down. So at the moment, we think the pro- small protocols are working, but if we can get a pass that works better and lets the fish up, we mean it, it, it results in uh, decreased mortality, which should help the numbers. Um, on the lower channel, what we're doing, we're putting in gravel now in the next few weeks at, at one site, and then there's two other sites, two other spawning sites. One site is calcified because it's below a, a sort of limestone stream, and the other site is silted. So um, of the three sites, they're all different, but one site is just the main spawning site. is just a complete absence of any suitable spawning gravel. Anything that's left in the site is huge, big cobble that, that is useless. But I think over time, you know, every spate is washing a little bit more, a little bit more out. But that's really that's really for the population of fish. We think the spring salmon that are in the river and then to save maybe the grills and boost their numbers is to get them up uh, above the dam with, with as, as much ease as possible. But really where we focus is we're taking the river in stages and right now we're focused on the bottom section with the dam being the overarching project in the background that we're working away on. Mm. But we're trying to improve what we can in the lower river and then we feel we get that to a level um, then we, we we look upstream, which has had a couple of problems actually itself. So the guys up there giving out that the trout stocks have plummeted up there and there's just mm. been a, a case against Irish water up there, Ballymore uses of the water treatment plant. And incidentally, the River Rye, which has probably given the the Liffey uh, a good majority of its of its grills at the moment, has actually had a fish kill on it last year, which wiped out half of that. Half the it's it's because of where it is. There's just so many challenges in terms of water quality and and discharges. Yeah, so that, that that's almost like the normal problems of any other river, aside from let's say yeah your weirs and your 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 dam, that the normal problems flee particularly in any place that's kind of urbanized. And I presume a lot of, let's say, the rye and above the dam is urbanized, so it'll have its problems there. So uh, coupled with that, like it's almost like to say it's like a double whammy almost. Well, well, I think the Liffey has a few bonuses in that our drinking water comes from it. So there's not mm-hmm. a lot of intensive farming and silage spreading, which the other, other, other rivers, particularly in the Midlands, stuff, have to deal with. And it hasn't been drained so the arterial drainage scheme has virtually destroyed most of our rivers and it's it's still going on where they go in and they dig the river and turn it into a canal and take out the, it just becomes uniform. There's no bends, there's no riffles, there's no pools, there's no glides. So that sort of degraded most of our rivers, particularly anywhere there was farmland. So that practice is still going on. I'm hoping soon that they, 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 catch, they catch on and, and stop it. There was an experiment done recently on the Stonyford River where they found it doesn't actually do anything to help flooding the dredging. So hopefully they realise that it's a defunct practice and they, they stop it. But in terms of the Liffey, the Liffey, the water quality now is, is far superior than it was 20 years ago. It, the water quality was dreadful and um, it hasn't been drained. So the catchment is still pretty healthy. If we can just get the, the barriers sorted out and um, free movement of sediments and fish, I, I think it'll be all right. Yeah, that seems to be it. And like, it's it's really good talking to you there, like because it's something that's quite easily identifiable, you know? And it's something that could be remedied as well, you know? Yeah, there's, there's steps being taken. Like I know on the friend of mine on the Kells Blackwater, where they do sort of in-stream works and, and and same on the Boyne and around the country to the Salmon and Sea Trout Conservation Fund. That's what we use for our funding mainly. But it's been done on a very small scale. Like we really should be rolling it out, taking out barriers on a massive scale, but also re- rehabilitating these drained rivers by by adding in not so much you can have paired deflectors or riffle bars, whatever it is, but but things to create the habitat or turn it back so it's suitable for salmonids. But if that needs to be done on a massive scale. Now I fire doing projects, but it's 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 gonna, you know, they're doing like a hundred meters here, hundred meters there. It's gonna take um it's gonna take a long time before it has a massive effect. 
And maybe mm. if there's more funding, if every club did a project a year, um, that would probably be the best way to we start to see some ground, see some traction in a few years. But yeah. there's too much of our rivers are unsuitable for salmonids at the moment. How many of you are involved in the Liffey Salmon Project? So there's there's this twelve in the committee, and I'm sort of the I'd sort of be the director, and then uh, I'd probably do the fair share of I probably do most of the work and and things like that. But the lads, I use the lads if I need something specific or advice and stuff. We sort of have meetings every few months. And let's not forget, you have a day job as well, and you know you're an angler, and then you're doing on this on top of it. Can I ask you, Mark, um, what's your ultimate goal? Because it's not going to be like the Moy. You know, it's not in terms of the number. So what for you is a, and why, like, is it, do you want to see people being able to fish it and catch fish? Or is it more that you just want to see it as a sustainable, thriving river once more? I, a goal for me, I don't know if it's achievable. Would, I'd like to see the numbers back around that 2010 level where there was a 2,000 fish in, in the river. So that's still way off its conservation limit. But that, that's where I, I, I think that would be achievable if we, if we hit our targets uh, the, the other main goal is to preserve that genetic large spring salmon, multi sea winter fish that it has, that we don't lose that, you know, 15, 16 pound plus fish that that runs and still runs that people see every now and again in it. So that for me would be the, the main goal that we protect the genetic stock and, and also those unique grills. So that we don't lose the, the sort of the capital city's main river, we, uh, no, which is an, uh, used to be an iconic salmon fishery, that we don't lose our. our our stock, our salmon all together, and also those specific fish that are are from the Liffey. Yeah, spot on. Like as a dub, you know, growing up at the Liffey, and I remember, you know, you'd be driving up by Island Bridge, and you know, just beautiful around there. Like even uh, tomorrow, I'll be coming in. I get into Houston Station, cro- crossing over the bridge, and it's amazing. I'll always look down, and to think <laughs> that salmon make it up. And like, you know, when you're seeing the, the muck and the dirt when it's down at low tide and you're just there wondering, thinking to yourself, how on earth the salmon are able to do that? And to think if you're able to get those numbers up to 2,000 of them coming in every season, it'd be just incredible to, to bring it back to life like that. When you actually go up to Island Bridge, it's still quite beautiful. There's all the islands there, but there's a lot of big, large sort of native trees. And it's actually, you're right beside the city centre, but it actually yeah. seems like you're out in the country. It's amazing. But I made a video there, was it, um, on Facebook, and I put it on the group. But uh, I was the only man out on um, on the 1st of January. But I was just saying, in the 90s here, you wouldn't have got on a stand. You wouldn't have got on a spot. Yeah, people could only fish for 20 minutes. Like, it would have been chock block The Dublin salmon anglers still have a get-together, but it's more points. They bring a couple of kegs down to their clubhouse there. But there's very little uh, people wetting the line anymore. But, um, like, it was really not so long ago, it was, like, a hive of activity there. It was a, a thriving club. And then just in the last 15, 20 years, it's, 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 it's died off. Not wetting a line anymore, just wetting a whistle. <laughs> we're, we're, we're wetting the whistle, <laughs> yeah. But in fairness, it's, and it's funny, like, you're saying that is, I would have always thought of the Liffey as historic, you know, you know, decades ago. But it is, like you're saying, if you could get it to numbers from... 13 years ago like we're not talking ancient history here like no we're not at all are we you know there's a bait there's a viable base there like that's you know like like even even five even five six years ago you were talking 700 800 fish so you know it's it, there's, there's still numbers there to to a degree um the only problem is seven or eight hundred fish in a river that size can be hard to find so you have to you have to sort of look for for bottlenecks and things where the fish get held up I'm fascinated you're saying, Mark, you were out on January the 1st. Like, A, you'd want to be hardy enough to go up to the drows on, on January the 1st, you know, or at least maybe there's more fish, but you were going out into the Liffey on January the 1st. That must have been, um, I suppose you're just going out, is it, to kind of mark the date? Like, Well, I, I would fish almost every day in the summer I'm off work. So, um, you know, I haven't gone so long. I do a little bit of pike fishing in the winter, but, you know, I, I, you're, you're just mad to get out, I think, at that stage anyway and cast the line. Like, a few of my pals would go to drows, but I think, yeah, you just, you're not too, it's just good to be out. Uh, the hopefulness of catching the fish would be quite small. Mm. Actually, Mark, what, what is your background in fishing? I grew up fishing the daughter here, um, and particularly on the last five or six years, it mainly only fly. Um, I qualified as an app guy, uh, casting instructor and game angling professional for oh, four or five years ago now. Good man. And um, since then, I've been teaching really on a on a voluntary basis. Like I've done a couple of clinics here for the club and stuff. But I mainly did the app guy so I would learn more and you know improve my casting, which which I found it was great. I learned so much, and it's really helped me as an angler. 
But apart from that, then I fish. I, I've lo- I'm in a lot of clubs around the place. So I'm in um, I'm in the Slaney. I'm in um, yeah, I'm in the Slaney. I'm in the Daughter, uh, the Talca. So I just and then I fish over the West. I'm in a group of. You've had a few of my friends on already. Been in a WhatsApp group with a, a bunch of lads, and we sort of travel all over the place. So um, yeah, mainly in search of salmon when we travel. Yeah, you sold your soul for salmon. You're you're like Dara, are you? You're one of them salmon lads, are you? No, I, I would say I'm probably an all-rounder. I target salmon sea trout and brown trout probably oh, to good the man. same good degree. Man. But actually, I, 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 I target them with the same tactics. Now, I carry two rods everywhere I go. And I'd probably have either a streamer on one rod now in big water and nymphs on the other rod, or I'd be swinging wets. But I'm chopping and changing um, or the dry dropper or something. But I always have two rods everywhere I go. And um, I sort of fish indiscriminately where fish places where I can catch a salmon a sea trout or a brown trout on the the same gear excellent do you find because when you start going down the kind of rabbit hole of conservation and the environment that it takes up so much that you're fishing I know it sounds selfish but that you're fishing then suffers as a result no not really I'm, a, I'm able to balance both and actually I just did a master's there just to, to finish actually got my results today but the last two years are sort of hectic with that but I still managed there was a lot of paperwork and drawn down the grant funding from IFI and then a lot of a lot of meetings with people but I still managed to get it done and and still fish a lot now I did there were some days I could have went fishing and I had to go do something else but I managed to fit it all in so I really we started this thing a friend of mine started the Facebook page we're always talking about doing something and I got sucked into um, just sort of I uh, setting up the committee and, I, you know, I, I spoke to over 120 people initially on the Liffey to learn everything I could about it. And then I just got uh, people just kept putting me in touch with more people, people who, who knew a lot about the dam and people like um, like the guys Revis Limited and Alan Sullivan who do the work for us on the on the Liffey. Like and they were just a hive of information. So um, it just, yeah. That's sort of what happened, and um, I just I just really enjoyed it, and I just kept doing it. That so doesn't it doesn't seem like a chore in any way, and I, I still managed to get out a lot. Well, fair play to be able to do all that, and in fairness, it's always easy for people to go, "Ah, oh, yeah, good man, Mark, you look after that." <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you find the kind of you you take up a lot of the workload, maybe. I found that actually I was delegating the jobs out, but because. I, I needed to, it was easier when the same person had all the files and was going to meet the people and sort of, yeah, it was difficult when I gave it the jobs in the ESC or IFI were dealing with different people all the time, it didn't work so well. Whereas maybe they just built a relationship with me, I was the focal point. And then if I need a bit of help with something, the lads will help me out. But that seemed to, to work the best way that I was sort of the, the person they knew. And then that went through me then. Really great talking to you. And it's been really good for me. And I often say this, because my knowledge on salmon is very limited. And to hear you talk about, you know, the way uh, with the Liffey and, you know, some of the problems that are there and some of them that can be circumvented and some of them that are bigger, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's been really, really, um, really interesting talking to you. But before you leave, um, we just get to the bones of what we always do on the show here. And I think you hopefully should know about it. But we ask everybody who comes on uh, what the most memorable fish on the fly it was so what was yours so my most memorable fish uh i'm going to go off the uh down a different route here probably the most it was a fish that wasn't landed so mm-hmm. it was a, a double figure sea trout on a wicklow river last season at night and um i was with a friend and um i was in that fish for i think over an hour so it, it, at first it felt like a log that wouldn't move he the fish expended no energy went round and round the pool only towards the end of the fight did he start to run hard but out an hour and I think it was an hour and nine minutes into the fight, it ran aground and beached itself. And we got a good look at it, tried to grab him, but he flipped back into the water and tore off into the shallows. And uh, my dropper, that was the last time we'll ever fish a dropper at night, but the dropper snagged in a tree <laughs> and that was that. Uh, and he, was was on the, absolute, he was on the point fly. He was on the point fly. So it was an absolute monster of a fish. But the, the fight was incredible because he, he expended, it was like being stuck into a moving log. And oh, wow. my arm was about to fall off at the end. But uh, um, it was a pity because I haven't I haven't recovered from that fish yet. No, um, that's understandable. Yeah. <laughs> and Kabir, were you aware that there was something of that size when you were fishing that pool? Yeah, I, we, we knew there was sea trout there. We, we didn't expect one of that size. And the take was very unusual. It was a very gentle take, um, which, which isn't usually always characteristic with sea trout. Yeah. But the, just the sheer weight. And he just he hardly moved and couldn't couldn't move him. Um, and then maybe I say it was probably I got a bit 
anxious at the end and I tried to bring him into a shallower bit of the river, which was a big mistake. So we took him out of the pool and then that was the, he beached himself and then that was the, he got, a, he got away then. And you actually, yeah, it's well, not, you, you actually saw him like, you know, you know, when you lose fish, you go, oh, Jesus, that must have been, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> we actually saw him. Oh, we, oh, we saw, we, we saw him clearly, like he was, he was, he was, he was on the bank just in front of my feet, like, you no know, more than a yard foot from me. So, um, yeah, no, we saw it. it a, we both got a good look at it. So it was a, a huge fish. To use a great Irish phrase, you must have got some land when you saw that fish. <laughs> yeah, oh geez. Well, we we I, we we knew something special um after about twenty minutes in, and this just wasn't couldn't couldn't budge him. And, oh wow! And even in, I can imagine like the pitch blackness of the night. You know, just to, to you must have been just your heart must have been in your mouth, like, and then just yeah, to top no. it off. Uh, my friend took a picture of me playing them and just the rod is completely doubled over but yeah you're just yeah it's just yeah it was an incredible feeling uh, I've got quite a few we've got a, quite a few at night but but nothing in, in that calibre like that but at least and I always say this at least you got to see him yeah you know at least you got to see him there's nothing worse than running into something very big and not seeing it because you haven't a clue but like when you see him at least you've some idea what you're into yeah, yeah no, exactly. So we 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 saw what it was, and uh, we we saw the size it was, and you know we were both sure it was over over ten anyway. Um, oh, wow. so yeah, but but now I have to live with that at night. Now sometimes I think about it. So. <laughs> and your counselor tells you to talk about it. <laughs> counselor tells me to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing, actually, to think this the sea trout that size on the east coast there. Well, the, the, the East Coast has the Welsh genetics in some of the rivers, okay. not all of them, but the, the, for example, the Slaney is quite small fish and, and that, that genetics is on the West Coast. They're more, they're more free taken in daytime, but definitely a lot of the rivers from Dundalk down to, I think, down to the tip of Wexford and Wicklow and Dublin would have, would have those bigger fish. And, and they're mm. still there. Sea trout are making a comeback. They're, they're, they're not struggling like the salmon are as such. They're, they're doing okay on this side of the, on this side of the country. Tell you, he's keeping mm. very quiet over there now about any of those big <laughs> fish being caught. <laughs> yeah, no, there's not much, uh, not much move. There's a lot of people over here, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You have to keep it yeah. stumb, like, you know. Well, Mark, uh, it's been brilliant talking to you. Thanks again for your time, for your insights. It's a pleasure meeting and finding out about people like yourself. You know, other anglers might get the accolades in terms of what they're doing, catching fish, but I think it's people like yourself mm who are flying under the radar, who are doing the hard yards. And, you know, let's not forget on a volunteer basis as well. So um, kudos is all I'm afraid we can give you um, our end. Yeah. But, you know, I think by highlighting this issue, by highlighting what, peop- highlighting what people can do um, like yourself, there's no excuse for the rest of us not to be trying to help out as well. And um, it's, uh, it's a great positive to take away. Um, I think after the year that we've had as salmon anglers to, to you know to try and do something because at least then you, you feel like you are doing something that can help so um, fingers crossed for the for the future and I would uh, look forward to the day when you, you can tell us about the salmon you caught in the Liffey yeah no no I will wait for that day very soon myself thanks for that lads our thanks to Mark McAndrew for joining us on the show don't forget to rate review and follow the Ireland on the Fly podcast on Apple Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from Plus, you can keep up to date on irononthefly.com as well as on Instagram. And myself and Tom will be back with another episode about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland.